I was sort of inspired by irritation to do this video. Um, really in premature anticipation of a series of projects that will be coming out over the next, oh, I don't know, year or decade or so relating to Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey, which has been uh, really an obsession of mine for the last year and a hobby of sorts and a, and a favorite book to return to for probably about seven years now. So um, it's something I'm familiar with. And the more familiar you get with Homer, it's, I mean, it's not unlike reading something like the Bible, where the further you get into it, the more you realize how little you actually know about it. And the more you begin to see, which just opens up more questions. And it can, it, it can be very easy to feel um, overwhelmed, to be awe-inspired by the greatness of this text. And to remember, and to, to feel as though you really have nothing to say, nothing to contribute to this. And there is no better cure for that feeling, in my opinion, than listening to the so-called experts speak about it. Now, some of them are excellent, I should, I should say. Uh, Dr. Greg Naj is a, a phenomenal modern scholar, for, for example. But um, I was listening to a uh, conversation between, um, this is from 2014, but I hadn't heard it till today, uh, with Adam Nichols, the author of um, probably the best introduction to Homer, um, Why Homer Matters, um, Adam Nicholson, I'm sorry. It is a, a, a phenomenal book, and he's being interviewed by this uh, professor of Greek culture at, uh, you know, one of these Ivy League equivalent schools in Britain. I don't remember if it's Cambridge or Oxford, one of those pretentious places. But um, it's a, a professor named Paul Cartledge, who's just, just insufferable, and uh, just, and he's all this time, very sort of passive aggressively prodding Adam Nicholson with this idea. Oh, your, you, you know, your your theory about Homer being much older than the prevailing theory has no evidence, or whatever, and then immediately goes on to provide this speculative theory that the Odyssey required less intelligence to write than the Iliad because it's just one thing after another rather than a grand narrative about anger specifically. Anyone who has read um, Greg Nagy's book, which I'm also going to plug here, I don't get anything from this. It's just a phenomenal book, The Ancient Greek Hero in 24 Hours. Um, no one who has read that book could believe that, that the Odyssey required less intelligence uh, to write than the Iliad. If anything, the Odyssey represents a more mature worldview and is more complexly put together. It's not one thing after the other. It's the development of one thing over time, just like the Iliad. In fact, the Iliad is, if anything, more linear. That the Iliad is... Here's the beginning of a conflict, and the book ends with the end of the conflict. The Odyssey is the development of something, which is, I mean, there's a reason that James Joyce, arguably the most brilliant writer of the 20th century, chose Ulysses, Odysseus, not Achilles, as his, um, as his challenge to match, you know, um, the supremely arrogant and supremely brilliant mind chose uh, uh, Odysseus as the rabbit to chase uh, and, and not Achilles. Uh, I'm not saying that the Odyssey is the better book than the Iliad. I'm just saying that classics professors, um, for all of their knowledge, and they are very knowledgeable, um, are, are not all-knowing either. And that uh, no matter how cowed you may be in your perception of your own expertise on something uh if you have that experience you're probably a lot farther ahead than you think um which i need to be reminded of sometimes so 
in that vein, I wanted to talk after five minutes of introduction uh, about a um, theory I have come to that I haven't really seen many people talk about in the correct direction, in my opinion. And that is a um, uh, a character who is sort of minor in the Iliad, but who's l more important than his brief appearance might suggest. And that is the character of Thersites. This is a character that Shakespeare uh, revives in Troilus and Cressida, his attempt to um, retell the important parts of the Iliad in his own time. And I want to talk about this character, uh, aside from him being just very interesting, uh, in part because most of the commentaries I've uh, seen about this character are of a very particular political bent. Thersites was a favorite character of none other than Karl Marx. Why would Marx even take interest in an obscure character from the Odyssey, the Iliad slash Troilus and Cressida? Before we get there, I suppose I should briefly tell uh, of the brief story of Thersites as it happens in the Iliad. In uh, book two, I believe, the second chapter, they're called books or scrolls, depending on your translation. Um, so uh, Achilles and Agamemnon have had their argument. And Agamemnon's like, well, screw it. We're going to keep on fighting. And um, he gets a dream from Zeus that says, you can, you can take the city now if you attack. And Agamemnon was like, yes, that's that's what I'll do. It's, of course, a, a deception on Zeus's part. Zeus is trying to accomplish his own purposes with this deception. But that comes out later. Agamemnon, being the um, uh, imperfect decision maker that he is, thinks the best way to begin this is to test his men's resolution by first pretending to be disheartened about the whole thing and he gathers them all together and he says oh man I don't I I don't think we're going to be able to do it I think we're going to have to sail home and he was expecting them to presumably to be like no we're here to fight for you and instead they just vanish they all just dissipate they're immediately like right right we're going home and they go back to their ships and it takes odysseus and a few other men to go round them back and say no 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 <laughs> let's not leave just yet um and it's the this big sort of demoralizing disaster of uh, the just the petty bad leadership kind um i'm sure military viewers will will be familiar with that kind of <laughs> phenomenon but then after he does that, this character that we had never heard from before and never hear from again since, who is described as this ugly and deformed and just like he's like bald except for patches on the side and he's got a hunchback and he's a coward. We were told that he's a coward as well. Um, this strange character sort of steps up and starts berating Agamemnon. Agamemnon isn't there, but he's just sort of bad talking him from from back. And uh, and this is Thersites. This is this the the haranguer. He's very skilled with words. He's sort of a like a comic roaster, and he just he just roasts everybody. We are told that he's constantly haranguing all of the kings, all the higher up people. And the harangue that he throws on uh, Agamemnon in this case is, oh, look at how, you know, this leader uh, is, uh, you know, he, he is basically, he's not leading well. He's taking away Achilles, who is the best fighter's um, honor and pride. And like, look at this, basically. And then Odysseus promptly comes up to him and smacks him across the back with a, with a rod and uh, beats him and says, you know, don't ever let me catch you, you know, talking like that again. And all the men who are watching 
and and listening applaud. They think this is the greatest thing that Odysseus has ever done is beat this annoying haranguer into silence. Um, and that's that's the last we hear from Thersites in Homer. He is mentioned in other stories relating to Penthesilaus, the Amazon queen, and other things, but that's not in Homer. So why would Marx and a lot of scholars take an interest in this character? And the prevailing theory that they go by is that Thersites is the is speaking truth to power. He is the the lower class, the working class, you know, because Marxists are, are all you know representing and speaking on behalf of the working class, apparently. Um, or at the very least, on behalf of the oppressed, because he himself is not a king. He's one of the underlings. Um, and so he's speaking back to authority, and he is the voice of... of um, well, I suppose we could say the voice of equality. He's the voice um, speaking back against this unjust hierarchy, which has been subjugated to the uh, incompetent rule of an incompetent ruler, Agamemnon, in this case. And it sounds kind of compelling, except, and, and, and the uh, scholars will even point out, uh, will, will even argue that perhaps this is the voice of Homer himself. Homer injecting his own opinion into the story via this character and having him beaten and everyone laugh at. and the the scholars say oh this is the way that everyone applauds seems like uh, like excessive like the author is trying to cover his tracks this is in my opinion um, some Freudian bullshit um, and tr transparently Nonsense. It's kind of shocking to me that this theory has gotten as much traction as it has for the simple reason that the complaints that uh, Thersites is, is making are more or less exactly the same complaints that Achilles was making. And no one hated Achilles for making those complaints. No one held it against him. I mean, Agamemnon obviously was in the dispute with him, but uh, no one, <laughs> you know, Achilles was respected for making these complaints. So what is at issue with Thersites then, if you want to get behind what he's saying, is not the content of what's being said, but who is saying it. And that, I think, was why Karl Marx was a fan of Thersites rather than Achilles, I mean, aside from Marx preferring the uh, the Thersites from Troilus and Cressida, who is the same character. He's just put in a slightly more positive light, but um, it's a, um, you know, he is speaking up to people who are above him in the hierarchy. And Marx was, of course, against hierarchy, as, as Thersites was as well. Whereas when Achilles was making his complaints to Agamemnon, he was speaking more or less as an equal and Agamemnon's base basically Agamemnon's rebuttal to Achilles wasn't you're wrong his attempted rebuttal was you are lower than me I will show you how much more powerful I am than you it's I'm above you you can't speak to me that way and Achilles says screw you I'm the best fighter you have don't disrespect the best fighter among you or you'll regret it, which he does. Um, and so the, the, the part of the equation that is critical and is left out by uh, crypto-Marxist and, and overt Marxist scholars uh, and other classicists in general, uh, and Paul Cartledge as well in some of his analyses that he gives in that conversation, is the first word which describes the subject of the Iliad, and that's menin. Menin, menis, is the root word, uh, is usually translated as rage or anger. This is a sublimely oversimplified conceptualization 
of what minion actually means and to to get a hold of just how oversimplified that is uh, I would recommend uh, this book by Leonard Molnar which is uh, like Naj's book available online for free you can just just google search the term Menis Molnar or anger of Achilles what Menis refers to isn't just anger or wrath it's a taboo term um and by taboo, I mean the sort of term that societies would, would try not to mention for fear of, you know, saying the devil's name and it appearing. <laughs> um, it, it referred not just to, which made the opening of the Iliad kind of startling, perhaps, for the audience. You know, this is, um, it would be like opening a modern play by saying, yelling incest or something. You know, that's perhaps a, Oedipus Rex story, not not our Iliad, but um, you know it refers, according to Melner, to Mulner. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly or not. Um, it refers to the divine sanction, so the, the the this sort of the universe reacting to and correcting against uh, a fault. Correcting, correcting against the problem. And the way he explains this is, uh, it's not even correct to call it an analogy because it's really more of an example. But as an explanation, he uses the story of Zeus and Hera, which is alluded to uh, in the Iliad. Hera at one point does Zeus wrong and Zeus in, um, in anger basically hangs her up by the by arms, suspends her in heaven, and then goes around indiscriminately to all the other gods and is throwing them down to earth, anyone he can get his hands on. And that's what menace is. It is this, it is the divine retribution against uh, basically uh, sins against the proper order of things because Zeus is the chief of the gods and and that is really a symbolic and metaphorical d depiction of what Homer is trying to describe with this term menace and according to Mulner uh, menace the the primary thing that you can sin against to invoke menace is hierarchy menace the concept of menace uh, is and, and there being a cosmic order that you can violate is almost tautologically tied in with the existence of and the respect for of the proper hierarchy. And so all of these um, customs, like proper burial of the dead, which we see in um, the Iliad, and proper treatment of strangers, Xenia, that we see in the Odyssey, um, those are tied in with this concept of menace because that is those are ways that you respect the gods and so to disrespect the gods is to invoke their wrath um a digression returning to um thersites though you know the difference between what achilles is saying and what thersites is saying isn't primarily in the content of their speech and so what marx is advocating uh, is what he likes in what he sees in Thersites is this upending of the hierarchy which he views as unjust unjust on what by what standard is another question and an interesting one but Homer doesn't begin there he begins with the existence of a hierarchy to begin with and that is and and you know, there are ways to challenge the hierarchy and more importantly, ways of climbing the hierarchy. Um, there is a beautiful counterexample to what Thersites uh, demonstrates in the Iliad in book five and book six, uh, both of them. Um, another uh, character who many people who read the Iliad for the first time might be tricked into thinking is the main character 
or perhaps the most noble or really the best warrior that the Greeks have, and it is an Achilles, uh, is a character named Diomedes, um, Tydeus' son. And he goes on a rampage and kills just about everyone, uh, injures a couple of gods, uh, injures Aphrodite, almost kills Ares uh, with, with the help of Athena and um, Hera. And is is just a just a killing machine, and uh, but is decent about everything he does too. He's very noble and and brave in his carriage. And before he goes on his Aristea, his uh, glorious moment in battle, Agamemnon is going down his troops, sort of kind of berating them and encouraging them, trying to get them all fired up, and he. Uh, he comes up to Diomedes and says, why are you hanging back? You, you know, your father wasn't like that um, and everything. And Diomedes' charioteer says, don't talk to him like that. He's we're, We were just getting ready. And Diomedes says, no, 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 he's he's doing his thing. You know, let, let the king do his thing. We'll just, it's not our place to speak back to ag, to the king. He is higher than us. And of course, to the reader who sees how the story unfolds, he is clearly uh, more noble than Agamemnon. And like Diomedes, he doesn't have anything to prove through speech in that way. You know, he just goes out and does. Whereas Thersites, all he has is words. Um, and so it's, it's an interesting juxtaposition. And, and given the amount of glory that Homer gives to Diomedes and the diametrically opposed way he has of dealing with Agamemnon, it is, I think, uh, not just impossible, but but, and not even stupid. It is uh, dishonest and working for some other axe you're trying to grind to suggest that Thersites uh, in any way represents what Homer uh, believes or thinks. Um, there's plenty of room to suggest that Homer is uh, suspicious, not just of Agamemnon, but of the, the motives that lead to war in general. And you don't need to rely on Thersites to believe that. What Thersites recommend, um, not recommends, what Thersites represents is, in my opinion, the closest thing to evil that we can find in the Iliad. More so than Agamemnon, more so than Paris, more so than Achilles, more so than um, Ares, even more so than the gods. Thersites is this little splotch of subterfuge and undermining that's quickly put aside, so everyone can go back and um, you know and participate in their roles properly. And to whatever degree Achilles acted wrongly, to whatever degrees Achilles was wrong to withdraw from the combat for, for not participating in his role um, that he was to play in life, um, then perhaps we could say from the similarity of the contents of their speech that Thersites gave voice to the dark and evil side of Achilles but certainly not to the good side of Homer.